I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to start, um, oh, and I should mention that um, that is the Pleasure Beach in Blackpool, just for some visual stimulus there. Um, so I'm going to start with um, two mom a brief account of two moments linked to bathrooms. Um, so it's interesting but not surprising that bathrooms have been the locus of controversy in the policing of bodies um, through language for a long time now. Um, so if just for a second we think back to someone like uh, Jacques Lacan, not someone I'm normally uh, keen on quoting. Um, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, sorry. There we go. Um, Lacan is not someone known for his progressive views on gender. Um, and yet, in, in 1957, he narrates a moment wherein um, two children sitting in a train carriage, a boy and a girl, stop at the station and see the signs for the ladies and gentlemen at their respective windows. Um, and they each see the other's respective assigned gender as if it were the name of the station that they've stopped at. Um, thus solidifying, according to Lacan, the bar of signification and of urinary differentiation forever. And he says, um, to these children, gentlemen and ladies will henceforth be two homelands toward which each of their souls will take flight on divergent wings and regarding which it will be all the more impossible for them to reach an agreement since being in fact the homeland, neither can give ground regarding one's unsurpassed excellence without detracting from the other's glory. So, leaving Lacan and moving back into the 21st century, um, we have this image, which some people may have seen. Um, it's been around social media for a couple of years. Um, it's by an artist called Tony Toggles. Um, and the moment narrated here um, I think it's quite important because it narrates a gesture of a kind of affirmative refusal from which new terms can and do proliferate. It's the challenge of saying, I would prefer not to. Um, identifying as, for example, non-binary can be read as an, a, a negation and an affirmation because despite the negative construction of the word, it actually operates in lived experience as an opening, as a creation of a new space. So that image brings together language and bodies in a way that speaks to linguistic theories pre- and post-structuralism, as well as highlighting a vital issue in contemporary queer life, which is all over the news um, at the moment and has been for a while. Um, so bathrooms are highly politicised spaces everywhere. So I'm in the process of developing what you might call a queer new materialist formalism for the book project um, I'm currently working on called, um, well, the working title, Queer Defamiliarization, a Reassessment of Estrangement. So this means, amongst other things, a reassessment of Victor Shlovsky's concept of defamiliarization or estrangement from um, Russian formalism, looking at this from the perspective of gender and of linguistic materiality. So today I'm going to talk, try and talk about four things related to this project. And they are um, the new materialist reading of the concept of diffraction, the agency of the, um, the grammatical form of the prefix operator in the English language, the feminist strategy of radical rewriting, and new materialism and intersectionality. So, and that might sound like quite a lot, but I'll try not to go too fast. Um, so what links all of those areas and why should we care? Firstly, um, I think that important work can be done through looking at the coherence or the co-constituents of oppositional processes or states. And some philosophers would quickly point out that a placing together of any kind of formalism with any kind of materialism is a placing together of opposing schools of thought. In thinking about a queer defamiliarization, I'm drawing on the materialist tradition in some sense, and I'm drawing on a phenomenological tradition in some sense. Um, and it's through the deviant use of these opposite traditions that we can find fruitful ways of making the matter of language bend, stretch, and create itself anew. So it's in a similar way, it's like the picture I just showed you. Um, 
Okay. So that maneuver of conflating opposing conceptual processes, um, so that can be done at a macro and a micro level. In the operations of both queering and defamiliarizing, we could say that these are processes both of ab abstraction on one hand and grounding on the other, or you could say abstraction on one hand and embodiment on the other. Um, a queer defamiliarization traces or enacts those opposing lines simultaneously. It foregrounds the body by estranging it, and it affirms through negation. So it's a question of both distance and proximity. It's also a question of agency and politics, because to be defamiliarized against one's will might be something a body encounters due to race, gender, class, disability, or other categories. But to seize that process and affirm it in the manner of appropriating injurious language, such as we see within um, the word queer, for example, um, I think that's an important process. So, moving to diffraction. Um, the title of my paper mentions a diffractive poetics. Um, so I thought I'd just quickly go through diffraction, how it's used in new materialism. Um, this is an, exa an example um, in Karen Barad's book. Um, and two, we have two sets of concentric circles occurring from two, two stones dropped in water. Um, and the interesting part is when the two sets of circles meet and interfere with one another. And that's diffraction. That's one uh, example of diffraction. And it's productive of new circles and patterns. Um, so this, has been, this concept has been explored by new materialist scholar, scholars Donna Haraway and Karen Barad as an alternative theoretical framework, problematizing or queering dualistic thought and calling for new conceptions of identity and difference. So the fact that single particles can also be waves and produce diffraction patterns is a simplified description of that paradoxical affirmation of quantum theory which forms part of the central core of new materialism. Um, and you can read about that in Karen Barad's book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, The Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. Um, so new materialism uses the concept of diffraction as something productive of difference in many forms. Um, and put even more simply, it concerns waves and the way that waves combine, overlap and spread when they encounter an obstruction. Um, two other examples drawn from Barad's book, the sea, um, in, the, in, the first, in the left hand example, hits the breakwater in waves of parallel lines, goes through the slits, and then forms what looks like semicircles, um, just like the concentric circles with the stones. Um, and from point A to point uh, C2, there's a large variation in amplitude of wave intensity, and overall, there's an oscillating pattern formed. And then with the, the light waves, um, a monochromatic light source hits two obstructive slits producing diffraction patterns. And the places where the two waves enhance one another are very bright, and the places where the two waves cancel one another out are very dark. Um, so as a concept, um, diffraction is non-categorical and non-judgmental. It defies disciplinary categories and resists hierarchies. Um, it forces us out of the comfort zones of using abstract, predetermined language and makes use of the body and environment in different ways. Um, and the breaking down of disciplinary boundaries through a diffractive approach um, is comparable to the breaking down of boundaries preventing us um, from understanding and affirming difference without prejudice. Um, as Vivienne Bozalek and Michalina Assemblia state in their paper from last year, in which they discuss the difference between diffraction and, reflect, and reflecting, uh, or reflection, they say diffraction alerts us to the entanglement of the apparatus in addition to the embedded and embodied researcher who is seen as part of the world. Diffraction provides additional affordances through its connection of the discursive and the material, with knowledges making themselves intelligible, intelligible to each other in creative and unpredictable ways. So the interference in, between, in and between disciplines, coupled with a focus on material agency, embodiment, and entanglement in learning, um, in teaching, in research, um, affords new ways of facing the multiple challenges around subjectivity and lived experience. Um, but as I'll come to at the end, it's not all good news. There are things we can take issue with this concept as well. Um, 
But rather than um, have been read as the oppositional processes of reflecting, representing, countering, facing, um, all of those oppositional words, um, diffract diffractive methodologies understand phenomena as differing from within, as mutually entangled and co-constituted, with no categorical separation between self and environment. So that's a bit on diffraction, but what about the poetics part? Um, and what do I mean when I'm talking about formalism? If we try to think about that word for a minute, if we try to define formalism in a formalist way, um, we might end up with something like the identification of invariance within a system. Um, so you might think, why would queer theorists want to identify invariance in a system? So thinking back um, to its original Russian formalist framework, defamiliarization exists as a singular active mode of seeing um, which Shlosky opposed to um, a passive type of recognition. Um, he opposes those two modes of perception in his uh, text, Artist Technique, in 1917. So I'm presenting defamiliarization here reinvigorated with added political dimensions of agency, orientation and power as an embodied and multivalent process which is critical at the same time as it is creative. So I'm looking at language as an embodied and agendered thing. So one example of um, how I've been doing this is um, I've been looking at prefixes in the English language, how prefixes work. Um, and I've just taken one, pre I've talked briefly about one prefix today. Um, I've looked at the, um, the prefix re, R-E, um, of remembering, rewriting, reinvigorating. I've said reinvigorating a couple of times already. Um, and, and it's reciprocity with the D of defamiliarization. There are other words we could think of there. Deconstruction is another one. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on re for today. Um, and one of the really interesting words which use that prefix is rewriting. Um, so to sum that up briefly then with rewriting, as an intervention, rewriting is constituted by a particular type of radical and contentious movement which has, has significance for feminist thought, um, which is constituted by the paradox that it creates the sexual difference that it seeks to eliminate. And within new materialist thought, that paradox is affirmed. Um, so this type of radical rewriting, I'm arguing that that process um, requires a simultaneous stasis and dynamism of borders and limits as well as a simultaneous desire for and resistance to categorization. So that's what I'm thinking is, is within this process of queer defamiliarization. So br prefixes briefly about how they work and what they do. Um, you, you're probably all familiar with the, with the processes of prefix, prefixation and suffixation and affix, which is either of them, is added to the beginning or the end of a base word. Um, that's from a nice old um, manual of English grammar. Um, there's also infixation, um, which I'm just mentioning um, because it has en endless scope for expletive creativity. Um, in the English language, there are examples we could think of. Fan-fucking-tastic. Abso-bloody-lutely. Um, you could think of others. Um, so we could think about morphology in general, but today I'm just going to talk quickly about the prefix. So the placing of any prefix before the rest of the word is important. Um, it precedes the word in both spatial and temporal terms. We can take the word, um, the prefix in the word prefix itself as an example. That prefix pre both expresses and performs the action of preceding. So that it, we could say that it causes the remainder of the word to effectively perform a forward leap in time. The pre of before presupposes the past, but the de desire within that pre to be before everything else reaches into the future. So that pre-prefix links the future with the past, but is also contained within the present. Um, a prefix is generally a preposition which enacts itself just as um, it does in the word prefix because it puts in it itself in a position preceding the base word. Um, and I've written about this before, and um, a, Natalia Lusty's not here today, but she came to, to London a couple of years ago and gave a talk about feminist manifestos um, and, I, and, and kind of inspired me to think about what we could do with that prefix. And I wrote a, a, a kind of manifesto, which, which, which I won't read out for you now. It was called B Contra, a prefix, Femifesto, and it had lots of different prefixes in it. 
Um, and the reason why I did that was because I wanted to show how prefixes can be radical and can do radical things. Um, so the, the, one, the one prefix which I think has important resonances for feminism is the prefix re. Um, and even that word resonance, a re sounding, um, it even occurs there. Um, so this, particular, this prefix has particular connotations the same as any other prefixes. It suggests a going back or a repeating. A, re a revolution um, is a cyclical, eternally propelling maneuver. Um, and the particular word that can be used as a feminist revolutionary tool is that of rewriting. Um, so as an intervention, radical rewriting goes beyond the limitations um, of what uh, Rick Dolphine and Iris van der Turen have called classificatory negation, i.e. Um, the post of postmodernism. Rewriting is a gesture that is uh, simultaneously critical and creative. As, Dolf as Dolphine and van der Turen argue, Feminist theory revolutionizes dualist thought by affirming paradoxes of sexual difference and by making a qualitative shift from the noun of sexual difference to the verb of sexual differing. And that's another morphological shift, but this time with a suffix as opposed to a prefix. Um, and that shift of suffix allows for sexual difference to be traversed rather than to be overthrown. Um, so I'll give you a literary example of a feminist rewriting. Um, Ali Smith's Girl, Girl Meets Boy um, is a radical rewriting of the myth of Iphis and Ianthe. So in Greek mythology, the girl Iphis is raised as a boy, falls in love with the girl Ianthe, and then they realize, um, and then the goddess Isis turns Iphis into a man, and they can marry and live happily ever after, and everything's fine. Um, but Smith um, transplants the Iphis myth to Inverness in Scotland in the year 2007. Um, it's a brilliant book. I highly recommend you to read it if you haven't done so. Um, this novella queers its very own narrative line through syntactical playfulness. It's also all about water, which I think is quite timely considering the two publications that I've been to book launches since I got here have been about the sea. Um, so um, humans are 80% water, as social media seems to keep telling me. We are um, basically cucumbers with anxiety, is what I keep seeing everywhere. Um, in Girl Meets Boy, Ipis is reconstituted as Robin, a gender-fluid political activist with whom Anthea, reluctant employee of evil bottled water company called Pure, falls in love. <laughs> Um, Smith's use of water's universal pervasiveness in Girl Meets Boy is very sexualized, culminating in a series of syntactically parallel questions whilst narrating the lovers in enthralled in their very first night together. Was that what they meant when they said flames had tongues? Was I melting? Would I melt? Was I gold? Was I magnesium? Was I briny? Were my whole insides a piece of sea? Was I nothing but salty water with a mind of its own? Was I some kind of fountain? Was I the force of water through stone? So these questions don't require any answer, but they beautifully encapsulate what Stacey Alimo calls transcorporeality, which sees the body as coextensive with its material environment. Um, she says the term uh, transcorporeality rather than intercorporeality uh, suggests that the humans are not only interconnected with each other but with the material flows of substance and places. So the wateriness um, here, which is very, I've been reading the first chapter of Estrida's excellent book, Bodies of Water, um, so, uh, which argues very eloquently for an embodied understanding of our watery subjectivities from the perspective of feminist posthumanism. Um, and in Smith's text, the transitional nature of the language, the bodies and the elements invoked are both vital aspects um, here. And the, queer, the narrative that which she's drawing from Ovid's Metamorphoses, arguably a queer narrative already, is further queered in her linguistic virtuosity. Um, a couple more examples there. Um, the process of metamorphosis itself is rendered real and physical, again through the language describing the sexual act. I was hard all right, then I was a sinew, I was a snake. I changed stone to snake in three simple moves. Stoke, stake, snake, then I was a tree. That list, stoke, stake, snake, literalizes the material process in, in a, a really radical way. The words are pre-existing, but the syntax eschews the syntagmatic line and becomes serial. 
Um, another syntactical deviation Smith employs to literalize language's transformative power is, the, is an 103 word sentence, very Joycean, I think, um, consisting of the repeated phrase, I was, or we were, with a different noun, a descriptive noun phrase. Um, I haven't put the whole sentence up there, just a, um, a very abridged version. I was a she, was a he, were a we, were a girl and a girl and a boy and a boy. We were blades, we were a knife that, cut th that could cut through myth, with, with a tail of a fish, with a reek of a cat. Can we really keep this up? In that example, the elimination of any conjunctive word between the phrases in favour of another phrase very much com conjures up the sense of an eternal linguistic becoming, um, queering not only the metamorphoses of Ovid's text, but also queering becoming um, in a Deleuzean sense. Um, so the linguistic experimentation in Smith's text renders the fluidity of being at every juncture. Um, so that's, a, that's one example. And I, in my own writing practice, um, which is very much entangled with this current research, um, I'm trying to perform a rewriting of a canonical modernist text which does a number of things. So the novel I'm writing called Pleasure Beach um, queers Joyce's Ulysses through an exploration of sensory diffraction, mental illness, gender and class. It reframes the narrative, it resets it in a, in a grotty northern English seaside town, Blackpool, which is my hometown, in the year 1999. Um, it recasts the characters as female um, and it, it, it's, it's a performance as, and I've performed it at various events with lots of images and sounds as well. Um, so to, to change swiftly over to a, something else I wanted to talk about, um, which is, I think is an important debate within new materialism at the moment, um, the question of its um, arguably overwhelming whiteness. So I'll take the concept, the concept of intersectionality, um, which comes under fire from some new materialist feminists. Um, Karen Barad and Iris van der Turen have both um, taken issue with what Barad calls the Euclidianization of intersectionality because the figure that it uses, the intersection, um, is one drawn from recognizable Euclidean geometry and not the more complex idea um, proposed by Barad of the space-time manifold or of diffraction which I've talked about. Um, so. Um, the diffractive ripples in the water, um, they argue, they don't just intersect with one another, they cause further infinitesimal interferences. So Barad said in, in, in 2001, she says, identities are not separable, they do not intersect. Rather, identity formation must be understood in terms of the topical, topological dynamics of intraactivity. Um, and as far as I know, Barad hasn't reiterated that critique explicitly. Um, but in uh, 2013, um, Iris van der Turen and Evelyn Geertz published an article which um, critique intersectionality um, heavily in favor of interference, Barad's interference. And according to them, intersectionality's shortcomings are summed up by, firstly, its geometrical limitations, um, and also for, they argue, its representationalist and defeatist logic, which does not allow for women with partial privilege a voice at all. Um, so, uh, Sarah Ahmed's um, position paper from 2008 articulates her frustration with those critiques in no uncertain terms. She says, if my argument against such gestures means anything, it means this. When we describe what it is we do, when we consider how it is that we arrive at the grounds we inhabit, we need to appreciate the feminist work that comes before us in all its complexity. We don't always have to make a return to earlier feminist work, but if we rep represent that work as being this or that, then we need to make that return. Such a return would be ethical. We should avoid establishing a new terrain by clearing the ground of what has come before us, and we might not be quite so willing to deposit our hope in the category of the new. Um, there have been other comments which I've just added on there. Jasper Pua um, describes new materialism as having a, a white episteme um, in 2014, and then Nikki Sullivan describes new materialism as having a white optics. Um, and then Peter, H Peter Hinton and Zin Liu um, summarized in their paper a couple of years ago. In a nutshell, then, new materialism's overriding attention to delivering a post-humanist and post-anthropocentric analysis orients it away from the still pressing questions of race. 
So my instinct tells me that um, the language used to negate intersectionality by new materialist feminists potentially sets up a bit of an unhelpful dualism between the two onto-epistemological frameworks which politically should be working side by side and is perhaps a bit too hasty in dismissing the work done by feminists of colour by, in proposing the geometrical model in the first place. Um, intersectionality and interference need not be set up as differing either in degree or in kind, but rather as part of the story of a shared struggle and acknowledged as such. Um, I'm possibly going to run out of time, so I'm going to finish by just going back to this great image. Um, so, as we can see in that image, the oppositional processes of eliminating and creating linguistic terms are encapsulated in the way that we can think about gender in a queer sense. And the non-binary identifying human affirms through refusing the binary classification and new alternative terms proliferate at a rapid rate. So you cannot rely on recognition, you have to actively see each human. There's no dictionary, there's no pre-existing structure, no blueprint to organize experiences, relationships, or subjectivities. So you have to create your own terms. And that's why queer defamiliarization has political potency. Thanks.